All right, well, um, I really, I think the text that I've already read for the meditation is probably sufficient for our scripture reading. Again, we're looking at the fourth commandment. Um, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and this pattern that um, the Lord has given to us, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. So um, much to say about this. Let's um, uh, just again review what we saw this morning as we broke ground on the Sabbath. Um, remember the Sabbath is, is the day the Lord has given us where we set aside our work, the things that we would normally do on other days, particularly our vocation. And the things that might, you know, distract us that are in this world, such as in recreations that we enjoy, that together we might spend the, the day with Him in public and private worship. By the way, one thing that isn't mentioned in our confession and perhaps often isn't in this discussion is this is also supposed to be a day of rest. You know, we get, we get to rest too. Uh, it seems like some of the Puritan protocols for the Sabbath were so austere that they'd probably wipe you out <laughs> for the week. Um, but we are to get rest and we are to spend time, of course, with the Lord and with one another. Now, we've seen so far that churches differ on this issue. Uh, some believe the Sabbath doesn't continue. Others that it does, but it should be observed on Saturday. Others that Sunday is the right day, but um, it's only for the church, while still others that the Lord intends the Sabbath for everyone, uh, everyone in the world. And you know, we're going to see a little bit more about that uh, this evening. Now, that last position is the position this church holds, that our Lord commands us and all mankind to rest and to worship Him on the first day of the week, not because He needs our worship, but because we need to worship Him. We need to remember our blessedness really comes from blessing Him, and God commands it because, again, He knows we need that blessing. Now, we also saw some of the reasons that there must be a day like this from natural revelation. I mean, God has shown us uh, from nature both that He exists and that we are dependent upon Him as, uh, for everything, uh, with, you know, for our existence, uh, not just from the beginning, um, but also the continuance of our being, as well as everything that we need to, to live, air, water, food, clothing. Uh, these are things that, that nature teaches us. So since we understand our dependence upon this, this infinite being who is the source of all things and that we have received everything from Him, as we saw this morning, we are to return thanksgiving, give Him thanks, thank Him for what He's done, uh, to honor Him, giving Him the credit for this, uh, praise Him. In, in other words, worship Him. That's what worship is really all about. Now, Worship takes time. You know, we, we should give Him, we should honor Him by giving Him our complete attention, set aside time where we would be undistracted. And we also saw that it should be the same time for everyone so that we don't distract others from worshiping the Lord, but help each other carry out the duty of this particular day. By the way, I was thinking as that car went by and revved its engine, you know, or was it a motorcycle, I forget. But it just reminded me of what we looked at this morning. If everybody were observing the Sabbath, we wouldn't have all these confusing noises except perhaps for the uh, periodic ambulance or uh, fire truck that, that is doing necessary work uh, on this day. Now, we also saw that it needs to be just the right frequency, you know, how often uh, so that we don't forget God. If it's once a year, every two years, we could very easily drift away from Him. And it can't be um, so close together that uh, we don't have time to do all the other things that we know that, that He calls us to do, uh, taking care of ourselves, taking care of our families. And it needs to be the right length of time when we do set aside that time for Him, long enough to basically disconnect our minds from the world and focus on Him but not so long, again, that it gets in the way of our other duties. It's possible that we could get close to the right frequency and the right length of time through experimentation and trying different options, but thankfully the Lord did not leave it up to us to try to discover what that right balance is. 
He tells us in the fourth commandment, and really, as we're going to see this evening, shows us by way of example. So he tells us in the fourth commandment, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. So tonight what I want us to consider are three things. First, when God established the Sabbath. Secondly, indications that it was observed from Adam to, through Moses. And, um, of course, there's no, no question that once he gave it on Mount Sinai, it was observed. And then an Old Testament prediction that it would continue into the new covenant. So first of all, let's consider when God established the Sabbath. And thankfully, there's really no question regarding this. He established it at the end of the creation week. I really need to backtrack or back on that one statement. I think there are those that would question what it is that God is actually doing here, but I don't think we should. I think it's fairly clear. So we read in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now, Genesis 2 comes after Genesis 1 where we read the account of how the Lord created the heavens and the earth in six days. Now, one very important historic figure in the church, Augustine, raised the question, why did God take so long to create what he could have done in a moment. I mean, all he has to do is speak, and the universe leaps into existence, so to speak, by his divine power in a moment. Well, Augustine concluded that God actually did do it in a moment. It didn't take six days. He simply spoke, and it all leapt, as it were, into being instantaneously. But six days was the way that he decided to explain it to the angels. Now, don't ask me to explain why Augustine believed that. It seems rather strange to me. But I think there is another more valid reason why God took six days to do what he could have done in an instant. And it's because he wanted to set the pattern for us. Now, Edwards asked the question, what better time could there be to introduce to man how often he is to worship and how much time he is to devote to his creator than at the very beginning when he made man. He points out that God didn't make man merely to, to worship him, you know, at least not in the formal sense of praising and praying, uh, you know, stopping only to eat and sleep. That's not what the Lord told Adam and Eve when he created them. He, he made him and put him in a garden with a particular work to do, to tend the garden uh, so that it would produce the food that he needed to survive and also to keep it, which I hope we understand by now is not simply a repetition of tending the garden or cultivating the garden, but it meant to protect it, to guard it from any intrusion because it was God's holy sanctuary. Now, because man had a job, he had a task to do, he also needed God to show him when he was to basically take a break and worship him. And that's what God did by his creative pattern. He worked six days and rested on the seventh so that man would work for six days and rest on the seventh so that he might do his duty to God, which in this case would be to worship him. Now, we read in our text that God also blessed the, the seventh day or the Sabbath day, and he sanctified it, which means that he set it apart as holy, okay? Not because he needed it. You know, his work of creation didn't wear him out, but it was because we needed it. Even Adam and Eve had limited strength and energy, okay? They needed rest. We need rest. And, of course, they and we also have an obligation to worship the one who made us. And so God set this day aside for that purpose. We should also know that God's ordaining this day for man, that he did it, uh, that when he did this, 
He did it before the nations were formed. In other words, he did it for mankind, before the Jewish nation uh, came into existence, before God separated this people called Abraham and eventually gave his commandments on Mount Sinai. And I believe this is an indication that God intended this pattern for all mankind. I think we would all recognize that all mankind, each and every individual in this world is under the obligation to worship the one who created them. And that takes time, as we've already seen. So they are obligated to keep this pattern and this day of worship. Now, if there is any question that this was God's intent in the way that he created and in the time that he took and this particular cycle or frequency, he tells us clearly this was the case in the fourth commandment. Let me just read that for you again in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So we are to work six days and rest on the seventh because God worked for six days and rested on the seventh. That was the pattern he established from the very beginning. Now this commandment along with the other nine was intended by God to be his unchanging moral standard for all of mankind. Edwards, I think, has an interesting observation when he points out that God wrote these Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone, and he had them placed in the ark under the mercy seat where the blood of the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement would be sprinkled. It was foreshadowing that it was the breaking of these commandments that were written on the tablets of stone that Jesus would, would have to die to atone for. And he points out the ceremonial law, which, is, which was intended only to be temporary, was shown that it was going to be set aside because it was written in a book that was placed beside the ark and not actually within the ark. So these commandments were all meant to be permanent, including the Sabbath, from the very beginning when God establishes it at creation to the very end when we enter into what we would call the eternal Sabbath or the eternal rest of God. Now, second, let's consider some of the indications that it was observed from Adam until Moses. Now, this, this, we're just looking at indications. It would be nice if there were just clear statements, but there are no clear statements. Now, we first, I think, see its observance outside of the garden in the sacrifices of Cain and Abel. We don't have any explicit examples in the garden. We might even argue this one we see outside the garden may not be explicit, or perhaps it is. But I think we should assume that Adam and Eve kept this commandment while they were in the garden. It would be hard to imagine them simply working, eating, and sleeping, but never worshiping God especially since he's the one who gave them the, the Sabbath. Remember, he rested on the seventh day. He created man on the sixth day. So man was aware of this rest of God. As they cultivated the garden during the week and the Lord would give them an increase, I think it's not unlikely or it wouldn't be, I think, stretching it too much to say that they perhaps offered to the Lord a sacrifice from the first fruits of their harvest on that day, which would have been plant-based because you know, there, weren't any, there wasn't death yet, no sacrificial animals. And they offered it to the Lord perhaps as a fellowship offering where they would worship Him, rejoice in His goodness as they would eat the food in His presence. I doubt that they burned the food, but they probably ate the food. You know, there was no need yet for sacrifice except the sacrifice of thanksgiving before the Lord as they, as they worship Him. Now, their stay in the garden we know is relatively brief. There, there's not a lot said about it, and that's because they were uh, likely there for less than a month, and you've, you've heard this argument from me before. God had given to them a, a blessing and a command 
To be fruitful and multiply. And what does that mean? Have children, okay? Start a family. And they undoubtedly would have started on that right away because that was a commandment from God. And being perfect, there wouldn't have been any reason that Eve would not have immediately conceived, okay? But she didn't while they were in the garden. And that's not because sexual relations are a result of the fall. It, you know, God had already given them the command to be fruitful and multiply. There was only one way to do that. They undoubtedly started that. But it's because they were there for such a short period of time. We read that she first conceived outside of the garden. And that's really, I think, enough to prove the point. We read in Genesis 4.1, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and again, simply saying they weren't in the garden for long. But I do believe in the garden they were obeying God. Now, once <clears throat> outside, they continued to worship the Lord. And here's where we have the first example in Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. You know, it's interesting that this phrase in the course of time literally means at the end of days. And when you combine that with, with the pattern that our Lord has, had given to Adam and Eve and he has given to us, it, it, the natural meaning of this would appear to be at the end of the cycle of six days and resting on the seventh, on the Sabbath day, they brought sacrifices to the Lord to, in order to worship Him. So, I mean, here we see the pattern being followed at the end of the week, on the seventh day, uh, worshiping the Lord through sacrifice. Now, Abel brought an animal sacrifice according, I think, to the example God gave them when He killed the creatures at the fall and covered the, the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Cain brought something plant-based, okay, perhaps a grain offering, could have been fruit, we don't know. It's possible that on this occasion he wanted to imitate what his parents had told him that they were doing in the garden, which no longer would have been valid, or it could have had to, uh, to have done with faith, but I think most commentators would believe it's because Abel brought a blood sacrifice that it was accepted. And Cain knew what, what God wanted, but he decided to bring something else instead, and that's why he was rejected. God says, if you do well, will not your countenance be uh, lifted up? Now, we don't read anything about um, the Sabbath or the pattern specifically being followed now from the time of Adam and Eve to the time of Moses. But we do hear some interesting things about those who lived during that time frame, there were individuals who were singled out in the Bible as being righteous and blameless and those who walked with God. Let me give you three examples, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham. Now, for them to be considered righteous and blameless and to be walking with God, there had to be some kind of a standard by which these things could be measured. And I believe that certainly most Reformed commentators believe that that standard was God's law, the same law. That, um, uh, that was written on stone, okay? Even though it wasn't yet written on stone, it was certainly understood by Adam and Eve. I think Adam understood that he couldn't take a rock and strike Eve and kill her or just simply kill the animals. I think he knew that there was something that he needed to do. I, uh, you know, I mean, commentators argue, reform commentators, that um, that revelation that we have in our conscience of the law of God is simply a shadowy reflection of what Adam and Eve originally had in the garden, okay? And we certainly know that um, uh, it is argued in Scripture by the Apostle Paul that apart from the written law, simply through natural revelation, as we saw this morning, that man understands what it is that God requires of us. And again, that is the, showing the, that law written upon our hearts. <laughs> again, Romans 1.32, And although they know the ordinance of God, and again, from the context, Paul is referring here to all mankind, that those who practice such things, and again, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but he gives that list of things, are worthy of death, 
they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Now, again, that standard by which a man would be considered righteous or unrighteous, whether he walks with God or not with God, must include the Sabbath. Now, all mankind, as I said before, uh, might not know the exact day or the length of time, but they at least understood that they were obligated to worship the Lord. I do think the godly line, including you know, the, the antediluvians and, and the patriarchs, knew uh, since it would have been handed down to them through the oral tradition. I mean, how did anybody know what God's will was before Moses wrote it down? Things were communicated to God's people that were passed on through oral tradition until Moses writes it down in the Pentateuch and gives us an inspired history of everything that's taken place before that. So that's why we see them often sacrificing to God. I mean, we don't even see anywhere in Scripture where God says, this is going to be pleasing to me, you know, as far as God speaking specifically to them, except by the oral tradition that is handed down from Adam and Eve through the godly line all the way down through Abraham. And I think at least some of the sacrifices that they offered must have been offered on that Sabbath day. Now, when Israel eventually goes down into Egypt because of the famine and a Pharaoh, you know, that doesn't know Joseph enslaves them, they very likely lost their ability to keep the Sabbath. You know, they were slaves. They, they weren't their own. Uh, maybe the, the Egyptians gave them liberty. Maybe not. Uh, we don't know for sure. But we do know this, that as soon as the Lord brought them out of Egypt, the first thing he did was he reinstituted the Sabbath day. He gave them that day to rest and to worship because that is the most important thing for them. And then finally at Sinai, we know he engraved this commandment along with the other nine on the tablets of stone, intending that his people observe that from that point forward. Now, um, we've seen when it was established, we've seen some indications that it, it had to be observed uh, during the time from Adam until Moses when it was codified in the Ten Commandments. But finally, I want us to, um, to conclude by considering one Old Testament passage uh, that indicates that the Sabbath will continue into the New Covenant. And um, we're going to see other passages as we, as we go along um, uh, in the New Testament as far as how it's observed. We'll see some other indications from the Old Testament that it would be observed in the New Testament. But I'd like us simply to read Isaiah 56 verses 1 through 7, where here the Lord is speaking of a future time when those who are excluded from the congregation, the congregation of the Lord, would be brought in, foreigners and eunuchs in particular. And so let me read the passage, and then let me read a commentary on this, just so it's, it's not just perceived as my ideas, but Again, those ideas uh, that uh, are, are held, in, at least in Reformed circles. Okay. So Isaiah 56, beginning in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial, and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to Him, and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Now, I think 
certainly Reformed commentators believe what's being referred to here is the New Covenant. And we know that oftentimes when the New Covenant is referred to in the Old Covenant, it's represented through Old Covenant symbols. That's why we get this idea of burnt offerings and sacrifices. But notice the Sabbath, which is again a part of the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments engraved in stone, is said not only to be in operation, but those who observe it are said to be blessed of the Lord. Now, let me just read one commentator who writes uh, regarding this passage. He says, these prophecies are addressed to the exiles, returned from Babylon before the rebuilding of the temple in 520 B.C. They still suffer from idolatry, hypocrisy, and indifference. Isaiah prophesies concerning their responsibilities towards the coming glorious kingdom and the certainty of its arrival. Eunuchs were normally excluded from the covenant community along with unconverted foreigners. The Ethiopian eunuch of Acts 8, verses 26 through 20, or 39, fulfills this promise through faith in Jesus, the servant of Isaiah 53. As Philip reads the scroll of Isaiah with the Ethiopian eunuch, he, he doubtless draws the man's attention to this passage since his companion is both a foreigner and a eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch. Those with disabilities could not enter the temple in Jerusalem as a sign of the spiritual wholeness that the Lord requires of his worshipers. That eunuchs will have an everlasting name in God's house is a sign of the comprehensive spiritual restoration that is coming. The restoration will bring into the everlasting temple those who could not be brought in under the old covenant. Foreigners who become part of God's people will have the same privileges of service that the Levites alone previously enjoyed. The Lord's true servants are evidenced by their faith rather than by simple heredity. And again, the point is, this passage is referring to the New Covenant. At the time of the New Covenant, the Lord is talking about the Sabbath still being not only um, observed, but also uh, pronouncing a blessing upon those who would keep His Sabbath, even those, again, who would have been, uh, well, uh, how do I say, uh, repugnant to the Jewish mind, foreigners and eunuchs. Now, this, this is where I want to stop uh, this evening because, as I said, there's, there's really so much yet to see. And next week, we'll look at several New Testament passages that show us this as well. But for now, I want to simply remember the things that we've looked at. The Lord established the Sabbath at the creation. Okay? He sanctified that day, set it aside for man's welfare, for man's blessing, so that we would have a day to set aside everything else that distracts us in order to worship Him. And because it was something that He established at the very beginning, He intended for it for all mankind, because all mankind is obliged to worship Him. Adam and Eve observed it from the beginning because they were godly. They were, they were perfect, humanly perfect. They, they had what we call original righteousness, a desire to honor and, and serve the Lord, and they couldn't be endlessly working and not resting and taking time to worship Him. They, they undoubtedly observed it, and we see evidence that the godly line, the patriarchs continued to do so, and the Lord showed its permanence by writing it on stone. And this is jumping ahead a little bit, but let's not forget that that law that was written on the stone is the same law that God says in, in the blessing of the new covenant in, in Jeremiah and also the author to the Hebrews. It is that law which Israel would not keep that he changes now, uh, changes or gives the blessing of the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to keep. It's the same law because it's the same standard. We not only need to of course, have the true God as our God and worship Him as He tells us to worship Him. We need time in which to worship Him, and that's exactly what the Sabbath commandment sets, is the frequency of worship and the time that we are to take in, in giving ourselves to really spending time with Him in worship, in fellowship, and in rest. And again, the reason, I'll take this from Meredith Klein, the reason why he's given us the Sabbath is it's meant to be a, a sign of the covenant, a sign that we be, belong to the Lord. I mentioned before that 
you know, uh, on days, let's say, when we're worshiping the Lord, perhaps when there's more people and there's cars that are parked around here, the people that drive by, they at least see in the different church parking lots, there are people who are worshiping the Lord, who take it seriously enough, who, you know, are doing what God calls them to do. Uh, so it's a sign that we belong to the Lord, and the fact that we submit to it is also basically an indication, you know, that, um, well, that we are seeking to honor Him, um, you know, showing our faithfulness to Him by keeping this commandment. So the point is, may the Lord help us to be faithful in keeping the Sabbath day, not only for our own well-being, but also as a witness to others that they might come to know the Lord and His, um, you know, His salvation through Jesus Christ as well. Well, let's, uh, let's take just a moment in silent prayer. And uh, let's ask the Lord to, um, to apply what we've heard.